acting on a set omega, and the action is supposed to be faithful and transitive. So I will never mention these letters again. It's, it's like this now and forever. And I would like to make you curious about what I mean with acting with constraints by giving some examples. So what do I mean by constraints? Oh, let's have examples and comments. I like that. Yes. Let's have comments over okay. here. So my first example is that the group acts and points the letters of the That's a constraint, right? What else could we do? We could say that point stabilizers are non-trivial, but two point stabilizers are trivial. That's another constraint. As you can see, I use abbreviations. If they don't make sense from context immediately, please ask me. And also, if at any point I use notation or words that seem weird to you or don't make sense or you have not heard them, then just interrupt me immediately, okay? Please feel free to just interrupt me. That's another constraint. And then today we also heard things like primitive action to transitive action. So let's say our constraint is that the group is too transitive and we can say that is true. Maybe you've heard this. Huh, what else? talk about group elements and what they do. How about this one? Every evolution in the group, this means every element of order two in our group, fixes exactly one point. And yeah, and that's it. fixed points overall. Let's just say we have a number k, and every non-trivial group element fixes at most k points. And that's another constraint. This means um, all elements in G that are non-trivial. That's this little sharp thing fixes at most okay. points. Okay, lots of constraints. And maybe we know some of them. Okay. All right, so let's see. Um, if points stabilizers are trivial, and we have a transitive group, then we know what this is, right? Yeah, and we have heard the word before today. That's just regular action. Okay, so this is a constraint that we know. If point stabilizers are non-trivial, but two point stabilizers are trivial, then if things are not ridiculously small or anything, you would get a Frobenius group. Aha, so that's again something interesting. What else? Um, maybe this one rings a bell too. So if we're two transitive and three point stabilizers are trivial, uh, that's 
the definition? I mean, it depends. Some people have an extra constraint about non, not being degenerated somehow. Uh, these are Pfaffenhaus groups. published 1971. This leads to the concept of strongly embedded subgroups, which became an important concept in the classification of finite simple groups, among many, many other things. So let me just write down strongly embedded subgroups, and later we will go into more detail. And just because I had other names there too, let's write Bender and strongly embedded. There will be comments on the comments, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if we do not only say that elements are supposed to have at most k fixed points, if they're not trivial, but if we also say that there should be an element with k fixed points, then this is something that Rance called acting with fixity k. So this leads to the concept of fixity, and that's another research area, so expect more on that later. But for now, I will just write that this leads to France and, and others and to the concept of fixity. More on that later. Now, comments for the comments. I'm not going to write all this down. Regular action, well, I'm not going to say much about that. Where would you even start? For various groups, uh, we are going to look a bit later, we're going to look at how we can translate this property here, this action constraint, into a purely group theoretic property. So what are the consequences of this constraint for the internal group structure? That's going to be fun. Sassenhaus groups, um, they have been classified, I think, 1960-ish, Suzuki. And if you're interested, then have a look at the literature and just find interesting series of groups that have been found or classified by using constraints of this type or something similar. In particular, the Suzuki groups were found in this way because they thought they had already found groups with certain constraints and then they found new ones. So that's also interesting. So, and when I talk about the classification, I mean the finite simple groups with these constraints. And I think it was 60. So that's common for the comment. And here, so this was Bender 1971. And again, there's a classification theorem for these groups. So um, they could have cyclic or quaternion C2 subgroups, um, or something else could happen. And then if the group is um, uh, finite, simple, and non-abelian, then there is a classification. There are three types of groups that can occur, PSL2, Suzuki, and PSU3 with even characteristics. So again, there's a classification theorem. And we'll talk more about this later. Um, let me just say that this concept here can be generalized to talking about two fixity. And by two fixity, I mean the number, the maximum number of fixed points of involutions. And there has been, there's a line of work, um, not starting with Bender, but even starting earlier. So it was about involutions not fixing anything, and then exactly one point, and then something like at most 15 points. And 15 is not a random number. This paper exists. It's by Rance, and it's, a, it's an interesting paper. And then there were things like um, every group element fixes nothing. If it's not the identity, it fixes nothing, or a prescribed number of points. So there would be Pretzel and Schleiermacher, for example, with work in this direction. I should also mention Buchenhaut, and I'm sure I'm forgetting plenty of people. But this, this fixity business has been studied from various angles. And I saw it first for two fixities, so for involutions and then later more general, and we will come back to this. But before that, let's have some fun. So I'm, I'm a very finite group theorist in my heart, and a very local group theorist in my heart, and I always like it when I see properties that I can somehow take inside the group, to look inside the group and the subgroup structure and find connections. So I suggest that this is the kind of fun that we are going to have now. Starting with 
for beans groups. Whoops. Throw beans group action. So let's look at this property again that we have there. Point stabilizers are non trivial, but two point stabilizers are trivial. So let's look at some notation. I forgot who it was. Maybe it was. Emily, who called a point stabilizer H, and that made me very happy because I always call them A. <laughs> so, that alpha and omega, and H is the point stabilizer, and what I would like to do now is I would like to um, prove together with you that H is its own normalizer in the group, and that if we conjugate H by something outside of it, then the intersection of these two groups is trivial. So now we have translated this constraint of the action in, into a group theoretic property about subgroups. And I've seen quite a few of you nodding. That's nice, so you already know this but not all of you, so I will not bore the whole room. That's also good. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's first take an element. Well, I can just talk you through this. So H has a unique fixed point, namely alpha, because two-point stabilizers are trivial. So since everything that normalizes H has to respect the orbit structure, of H, it has to fix this unique fixed point of H. So this means that the normalizer of H also fixes alpha, and therefore it has to be inside H. And then they are equal. So another way of thinking of this is that this normalizer fixes the unique orbit of ring one of H, because in this way you can generalize the concept. If you find a unique orbit with property blah, 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 then the normalizer of the group has to stabilize this unique orbit with property blah, blah. Okay. And then let's look at this intersection property, if G and G, and X is in the intersection, oops, without H, and X is in H intersection G, then what happens? So x is in h, so it fixes alpha. x is in h to the g, so it fixes alpha to the g. Could this, these two points be the same? Well, if they were, then g would fix alpha, so it would be in h, but it's not. So alpha and alpha to the g are distinct points, and x fixes both of them, so it has to be trivial. I just learned that you should that you can say so, but you shouldn't write it. It's not proper English. Um, uh, thus, <laughs> it's not easy. I used to write this a lot. There will be many places where I would say, and now we can do this and this and this and this and this. And, and I don't want to do this now because I want to move on. But you can, of course, ask me later. Nothing will give me greater pleasure. So if you want to, so if you don't know everything about Frobenius groups yet, and you are curious about what happens next and how you can use these properties to find out more about the group structure, and in particular about the structure of the point stabilizers, then please ask me. Now I would like to move on and say a little bit about this constraint here. Every involution in these cases. One point, and again, I would like to just find out what it tells us about the group structure. So, let's say the strongly embedded case. And while doing this, I will also tell you exactly what it means to be strongly embedded. Let's say the strongly embedded situation. And again, this is really just an example of how you can take an action constraint and translate it into group information. Mm. So, again, let H be a point stabilizer. Oh, let's start with an involution and take its unique fixed point and then take that point stabilizer. So, T, G, 
energy and then evolution with unique, I don't have to say this, fixed point alpha and let H be the point stabilizer. Then we know many things. And one of the things I want to prove is then, well, H has even order, that's, yeah, I will write it down still because it's, it becomes the definition of something. Then H has even order. In fact, we will see it contains a suite of two subgroups. And for all G and G without H, um, the intersection of these two conjugates has odd order. So it looks like something a bit more general than what we just did. And just to, um, just for those who already know this, um, if you have a subgroup that has even order and whenever you take a conjugate with an element outside of it, if then the intersection has odd order, then you call this subgroup strongly embedded and you can generalize this to being strongly p-embedded where p is just some prime. So strongly p-embedded would mean that you have a subgroup that has order divisible by p and whenever you take an element outside and you conjugate and you look at the intersection, then it's a p-prime group. So it has order co-prime to p. So again, interesting local group theory concept. And here we see the place where, to my knowledge, it originates. I think it originates in exactly this paper by Bender. And I think he also came up with this name. Not entirely sure, but I think he called them strongly embedded and then later people took this notation up. Um, okay, so first of all, let's see. Well, of course, the centralizer of T fixes the unique fixed point, so it's an H. And then you look at a suite of two subgroup that contains T. There is one, obviously. And then you look at the center, it contains an involution and it centralizes T, so it fixes its unique fixed point alpha. So this has to be the fixed point for this involution as well. So now all, basically you can see that all the elements in the suite of two subgroup now have to fix this one involution um, alpha. So a full suite of two subgroup will be contained in H. Let's write this down. Um, and in particular it has even order. And now let's take this last bit and we will, it, it's similar to what we have already done. So G and G with H. And let's, well, so assume, let's say assume that this has even order and then we can take an involution in there. And assume that Let's say S is an involution, which we have if this has not odd order. Well, this involution has a unique fixed point, but what should it be? It's an H, so it's alpha. It's an H to the G, so it's alpha to the G. But G does not fix alpha, so again, they are distinct points, and they can't both be fixed by the same involution, because our hypothesis is that involution fix exactly one. So again, similar to before, we see that this involution does not exist. Oops, and alpha to the G, which is not alpha, which is a contradiction. So this intersection really has odd order. Oh, not so, uh, therefore. Right, and then you can go from there. And I seem to remember from the paper that one of the, one of the things that Bender does in this work and also in previous work where involutions have no fixed points, um, one of the basic steps is not only to understand the centralizers of involutions, but also to find elements of odd order that are inverted by such an involution and then to take things from there and do local analysis. It's all very beautiful. But I would like to come to this fixity business, because I got involved in fixity work with Kaimagad starting in 2012. So here's the question that he asked me, and then we will see how it's related to, to fixity. So um, he said, well, you know, Frobenius groups, 
two point stabilizers are trivial, one point stabilizers are not. What if we take this one step further and we say that two point stabilizers are non trivial, but three point stabilizers are? Do we know these groups? Shouldn't we know these groups? It seems to be such a simple question, right? And if the groups were too transitive, then we knew something about them, but we don't suppose that. So, okay, this was an open problem, and then he gave me some motivation for that. If you are interested, I can tell you later more about the, the motivation. But first of all, you can also just take it as an interesting permutation group question with an action with constraints, right? So that would be fixity two. It's an element with two fixed points and nothing except the identity fixes more than that. Okay, then you can ask the same question for three, four, blah, blah, blah. At some point we lost interest. Again, this comes from the applications that we had in mind. And what I would like to do now is I would like to take a fixity K and then together with you again, look inside the group. And what does fixity K tell us about the group structure? Let's see. So let G act with fixity K and I think this, um, this, uh, this name for it goes back to Ross, 1980, I believe, with fixity k in n, i.e. k is the maximum number of fixed points of non-trivial elements of g. So let's take this and then let's prove, ah, let's prove two lemmas. So the first little lemma, then I will need to clean the blackboards, yes. Lemma one, um, we get restrictions on normalizers of subgroups of the point stabilizers. So again, let's take alpha and my favorite letter H, alpha and omega, and H is the point stabilizer. And if you don't mind, I would like to keep this, this for the next two lemmas and then maybe a little bit afterwards. So in lemma one, I want to convince you that if we take a non-trivial subgroup of H, then we have some control over its normalizer in the following sense. If we take the index of the normalizer in the point stabilizer, in the big normalizer, then this is bounded by the fixity, by K. And the proof is just orbit and point stabilizer stuff. So let's take alpha. Okay, so given what I said earlier, namely that the normalizer of something has to respect the orbit structure of that subgroup. So the normalizer of x has to respect the orbit structure of x. In particular, all the points that are fixed by x have to be, so the set of these fixed points has to be stabilized by the normalizer of x. Okay, and since the fixity is k, this set of fixed points has size at most k. Okay, so we take the fixed points of x, and then we know that the normalizer of x um, gives an orbit of size at most k on if, if we start with a given fixed point, for example, alpha. So let's say k is an upper bound for the number of fixed points that we reach starting from alpha and applying the normalizer of x because it respects the set of fixed points. But now we know that this is just this index because h is the stabilizer of alpha. So that was easy. How is this useful? How can we get information about the subgroup structure more general than this? Um, with this little result. So it depends on k. If k is 2, then it means that basically the point stabilizer tries to capture all the normalizers of its subgroups. And it, it might go wrong by an index of 2, but not more. So somehow it tries to be a big 2. And then if k gets bigger, things become a bit more interesting, which is also why the papers get longer <laughs> and more complicated. But more on that in a few minutes. Um, let me, let me have you guess for a moment what comes next. Sulov structure, and I will clean the blackboard or two.
and let's take a prime number. And let's take a prime number that divides the order of the point stabilizer, and let's say it's larger than k. And let's see what happens. So this just means that P divides the order of H. So if K is 2, then being larger than K is not very difficult. You just have to be an odd prime. Again, this is why fixity 2 is a lot easier than the larger fixities that we looked at. Mm. Then I claim that dividing the order is enough for H to contain a full seal of P subgroup. So in some situations later, depending on what divides the order of H, this will mean that our point stabilizers become whole subgroups of the whole group. So again, useful information. So then H contains a seal of P subgroup of G. Start with a pseudo of P subgroup of H. It's non trivial because P divides this. So let, um, I don't know, Q, Q maybe. And maybe I want a pseudo of P subgroup of its normalizer. So let's call it P. And what happens? Okay, Q is a non-trivial subgroup of H, mm -hmm, like here. And then this says that the normalizer in H has indexed at most K in the normalizer of the same subgroup in all of G. So this index is at most K, which means it's definitely smaller than P, which means that this normalizer now has to be fully contained, uh, sorry, this P subgroup here of the normalizer has to be fully contained in H because it's in the normalizer in H of Q. And what does it mean if we have a P subgroup that is a Sulov subgroup in its normalizer? Well, then it's a Sulov subgroup of the whole group G. So we're done. Uh, hence, okay, I should do this once more. So there are other ways to see this. You can also take a detour over the center of a pseudo P subgroup. That's another way to do this, but the argument is always the same. You just use that the prime is strictly larger than the index, and therefore whenever you see a P subgroup in the normalizer, then it already has to be contained in this potentially smaller subgroup inside the point stabilizer. Huh. Rebecca? Yes. Is the last H meant to be a G? Say it again? Is the last H meant to be a G? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's correct here, but it wasn't correct there. Thank you very much for correcting this. So what does this mean? It means that if you look at fixities, let's say two, three, and four, and these are the ones we were interested in, Kai, Magad, and I. Um, for fixity 2, it means that once you have a prime that is odd, you have full control over the situation in the sense that somehow the primes dividing the group order fall into two categories, the ones that see the point stabilizers and the ones that don't. If you see the point stabilizer, then it contains a pseudo subgroup, and otherwise it has nothing to do with it, which then restricts the structure of fitting subgroup, blah, 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 then you can do more things. And if the fixity is 3 or 4, then things get more interesting because then you can act in more interesting ways on the fixed point set, and then not only the prime two becomes an exception, but also the prime three becomes an exception, and you need to put work into the analysis of the pseudo-structure there. You don't have a one or nothing, or all or nothing situation. But at least for the larger primes, you still have an all or nothing situation, and since one of our steps in the program was to classify all the finite simple examples of groups that act with low fixity, they are just not very interesting if they are not divisible by primes larger than three. So we definitely had something to work with. So let's talk briefly about the program, and then I will stop.
let's, it's not a proper name, I just made it up. The Low Fixity Action Program, maybe. As I said, I just made it up. I have to say sorry to Kai because I didn't ask him. So he, he asked me in 2012 to start working on this with him and I had a lot of fun. And together we, yeah, let me just go through the fixities one by one. So let's start with k equal to 2. This is how everything started. Kai Margaret and me and some, and some grant money from the DFG and so on and we started working on this. And our goal was to find all the finance the groups that can act with fixity 2 and describe all their possible actions. And then we also wanted to have some general results, not just restrictions for finite simple groups, just in case. And in fact, I was also interested in, or both of us were also interested in soluble groups, um, but we didn't do it then, but later uh, a student of mine did it beautifully. So we have some results there as well, just a bit later. So um, let's say classification of all, Finite simple groups. Of course, we use the classification too. Although I have this vague feeling that fixity two might be possible to be done without it, but I haven't been able to. And later, I have no hope. That's a different story. Um, so we did all the finite simple examples. We have PSL three four. That's a sort of exceptional little case with point stabilizers of order five. And then we have PSL2Q and Suzuki-Q, series of actions, several actions, in fact. And we describe everything in the paper. And then we also have some general structure results. And all this was, and this is published, 2015, and this is with the And then there is more stuff. So, the applications that Kai had in mind came from Riemann surfaces and their automorphism groups and the, and the possibilities to find Weierstrass points. Weierstrass points are just points on a Riemann surface that are somehow, depending on how you look at it, geometrically or analytically special. So there are several properties that are all equivalent. And there are ways to find them as fixed points of automorphisms. Um, and this led Kai to be interested in groups that just have, where just the, the group elements have just very few fixed points, which means you can't find Weierstrass points using them. So this was the, very briefly, this was the motivation. But then once we had this classification, we thought, okay, going to the applications, it means that now we have theoretical possibilities for a group acting on a Riemann surface and acting in such a way that on the non-regular orbits, it acts with fixity too but not in too many ways. So in total, you are still not allowed too many fixed points. So you get a theoretical, what we call branching datum, describing the action of the group on the surface. For this, the point stabilizers have to be cyclic, otherwise there's no way this can work. And we have some other constraints. And so one of the questions we had after our classification work was, once you have all the, the groups and the actions, which ones of the theoretical possibilities do actually occur, which means there exists a Riemann surface such that a group acts on it in this way. So we call this the realization problem, or I call it this way. Um, my PhD student, Patrick, did all this for fixity too. So I have examples, if you want to know more later, I brought some examples for branching datum and things and how they work and don't work, so if you're interested. Um, so the realization problem is solved completely, and this is um, Saarfeld, Weidecker, and that's much later, that's 2020. And the soluble special case has been done by one of my students, and that's not yet published. But, yeah, I have some papers to write. Let's move to fixity three. So, as you can imagine, sometimes when we were inside our group and studying the situation, we went to subgroups where you had suddenly fixity two instead of three, or maybe you had previous work. So we needed previous work. Um, this took 
longer it was more difficult, so it's kind of a weird coincidence that the two papers got published in the same year. Again, we have a classification of all the finite simple examples, and again with all the possible actions, and again you have this mixture of um, individual cases, so some alternating groups, and then you also have two sporadic groups, Matthew 11 and Matthew 22, I think, um, and other stuff, and then you have a series of groups um, showing up as well, just as before. We describe all this. We Again, we have some general structure results. And again, this is the same to authors. And again, 2015. And again, the realization problem is solved. Again, by Patrick Saarfeld. He did a lot of stuff in his PhD thesis. And that was published I think the year is this year, I think. Um, and something I should say just because it makes life more interesting. Some groups appear with several possible fixities and then in their action on a Riemann surface they could act on different non-regular orbits in very different ways and still not have too many fixed points in total, so I call this mixed fixity, and that's fun. So we had to deal with this here, and then later for fixity four again. And again, my, um, and one of my students did the soluble special case. And yeah, this is, this is done, this is um, not yet written up properly. And now we have fixity four, and then we stop, because five is the magic number. If a non-trivial automorphism of a, of a compact Riemann surface of genus at least two, blah, 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 fixes at, more, at least five points, then these are Weierstrass points. That's a theorem that is attributed to Schoenberg, and that's why we stopped at fixity four. Okay, all of this is unpublished. So we have a classification of all the finite simple examples. And this is where Barbara Baumeister enters the picture, um, and also my PhD student, Paula, who, by the way, knows many people here and says hi. <laughs> <laughs> so this is done, and now this becomes bigger. So now it's Baumeister, Kendall, Magad, although for parts of this he was not around anymore, he died a few years ago, sadly, but we keep working, of course. So that's Baumeister, Handel, Magad, who else is there? There's me somewhere. Oh, there's still Patrick Saalfeld, um, because he did something there as well. And then there's me, I think. So this is on the archive, but we still found a few things we want to improve, and lots of typos, so stay tuned. There will be a new version coming up soon. There are some general structural results that we have, but that are not yet written up properly. So that's going to be a while. So here I can just say, okay. And what else? Oh, <laughs> the realization problem is solved. Because we had conjectured the correct list of finite simple examples for a long time. We just needed to really prove it that we found everything. But given this list, my PhD student Patrick sat down as a part of his PhD thesis and solved the realization problem for everything in the list. And since the list was complete, it's solved. So that's great, but it's not yet published. Right, uh, I don't think we have nice results yet about the soluble special case, or at least nothing that we could write up nicely and closed as theorems, but some of these things go into the general structure when we describe a, just a general finite group that acts with fixity four, and we describe its generalized fitting subgroup and things like that, and then yeah, these things play a role. So some of this is still work in progress, or it needs to be written up properly. Um, but at least it's finished and we are sure that we found all the finite simple examples, which is a huge deal. And now we have all this data. So I have tons of projects coming, coming up here. So doing more things about the soluble groups, then we want to revise some of the earlier work because now we know more literature and some things might be a little bit simplified. And also we understand the problem better now just because we have been working in it for 10 years. 10 years. Mm -hmm. And... Um, then we have all this data, 
all this data, for example, for the branching data for the Riemann surfaces, it would be nice to put this in, for example, a com computer algebra software for people to look it up, to be able to access it, just the same as for all these tables that we have for all the examples. Then for many groups, we have a complete fixed point profile for all the hundreds of classes. And all this kind of stuff, so there's lots of information that's just waiting to be put out there in a way so that people can use it. Mm. Then there's also the special case where we're not just acting on a set, but on a group. What does low fixity mean when you act on a group? That would be interesting. And there are lots of other things, but I should probably stop and leave it to you to ask me if there are details anywhere here where you are curious because as you can imagine there's lots of things to say about the strategy and special cases and all this. Yes, but I leave this to you because at some point we all want to have dinner and it has already been a long day so thank you for listening. <laughs>
if you have things like the group and information about the, the branching and how it acts on the non-regular orbits, and then if a generating system for the group exists with certain properties, um, something with commutators and something with the, the um, I think it has in it that the points that are of cyclic. So it's three conditions, and if, if they are all satisfied at the same time, then there actually exists a surface with blah, blah, blah. It's not uniquely determined. I don't, I don't even know how you would go about restricting this, but the way we do it is we say, if, if, if we have datum like this, then there is a surface where this is realized, and conversely, if a group acts on a surface like this, then it's one of our groups and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it goes both ways, but there is no uniqueness. Sorry, did this answer your question? Okay, so this, this was weird. I would, I would have thought that there's either no exception or plenty, but just one is kind of weird. I noticed in lemma two and the strongly embedded situation that in both cases you're able to include each contains a CELA two subgroup here, a CELA P subgroup. And it made me wonder if there's extra assumptions you could add to lemma two that would allow you to conclude that H is even strongly P embedded. Yeah, so this is what so this is what we do for fixity uh, three and four when we look at the prime three. Because for fixity two, the prime two is already special, so you might have a strongly embedded subgroup or something else might happen. And the natural case distinction that you look at then later is whether point stabilizers have even order or odd order. Because if they have even order, then you can start with the solutions, blah, blah. But if not, then you have to do something else. And the same goes for being of order divisible by three. And then in the higher fixity situations, we will get situations like um, there might be a strongly three embedded subgroup, or we have some other restrictions on the three structure. So yes, okay. yes, yes, that's exactly what we do. And in fact, for the, for the hardest stuff that's going on here with fixity four, this is exactly the strategy that we follow. So you might have strong embedding, which means prime two, you might have strong three embedding, and then you might have these cases in the middle. So for example, um, the point stabilizers could have odd order but divisible by three, but the pseudo of three structure is kind of small and restricted and you don't have a strongly three embedded subgroup and then you could get information. Or, and that's the longest case, your point stabilizers could just have odd order then they are all subgroups, which is good, but then you don't have these small primes to work with and you have to think of something else and somehow these two sets of primes are so disconnected now in your group that it's hard to get a group. And then, um, yeah, so what helps us is the, the whole subgroup um, property of the point stabilizers and also when we go through the classification of the finite simple groups and we look at the subgroup structure, once the group is big enough, then very often you just find enough subgroups that pull in smaller primes so that at some point your point stabilizer structure just breaks down and it doesn't work. Um, but for fixity 4, we find quite a few series of examples, like infinite series of groups that give generic examples for fixity 4. So a lot is happening there. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. You just mentioned there you get these infinite families mm -hmm. for fixity one, uh, two, three, four. Uh, is it all in bounded rank? Or, or are they? I think so. Yeah. So they get more, but I think everything is very bounded. So for fixity two, it's just Suzuki and PSL two, and then there's this one exception. It's not a series. For fixity three, it's PS. L3 and PSU3, and then for fixity four, it's PSP4. But then there's also other stuff, so let me just make sure I don't say anything wrong. So Suzuki comes back, PSL2 comes back, and there's a natural way to construct from a fixity 2 action and a fixity 4 action. And then there's other guys like P omega minus 8, um, 3D4, twisted G2. So suddenly there's a lot more going on. And then we also have more sporadic. So for fixity 4, we even find a young group. Yanko 1 is a fixity for So it just gets more interesting. Um, in the cases where you have these Riemann surfaces where the automorphisms can't be used to find bias trust points, do those points still exist? There are 
several ways to go about this. So first of all, there are sort of weaker versions of bias trust points that you can still find if you have a lower number of fixed points for automorphisms, so you could do something there. And then there are just other ways, more complicated criteria. But I have not looked into this very deeply because I always thought this is kind of the next step. So once I have these groups and these actions and the branching data, blah, 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 I would actually like to go and say, can I still do something? Or is all lost, uh, all hope lost? Um, yeah. Okay. Other questions? No? Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you.